much for being here with us today. I am Jasmine Williams Washington, and I am excited to dive into this session today on strengthening the ecosystem for community power building, how to get started. So for those of you who may be new to us, uh, Community Science is a consulting firm focused on building communities, capacity, and partnering with them to create real lasting change. We bring an equity-centered approach to evaluating um, and doing the work and everything that we do. Uh, whether it is community development, organizational transformation, or large-scale systems change work, our passion lies in leveraging data, research, and collaboration to help communities and funders reach their full potential. And the work with One Schenectady is a great example of that work that we'll share with you today. Um, we're partnering with the Schenectady Foundation and the community to co-create solutions that are truly resident-driven and equity-focused. All right, so a little bit about myself. I am a managing associate at Community Science. Um, I come to you with over a decade of experience in community organizing and systems change work. Um, as the project director for the Schenectady Foundation um, initiative, I work closely with other funders um, and communities to drive sustainable systems change work. Uh, my focus specifically lies around uh, power building and organizational development, and I specialize in helping groups to take those critical first steps, because you just have to take the, the first step uh, toward lasting change. Today, uh, we'll be taking a closer look at One Schenectady and where we are today, um, an initiative led by the Schenectady Foundation with the support from Community Science. Um, and we'll explore what it takes to mobilize and sustain resident-led change in general. So enough about me. Um, I am thrilled to introduce to you our two panelists for the day who bring both experience and insights uh, to this conversation. First, we have Robert Carrera, Executive Director of this Schenectady Foundation. Um, he has over 30 years in the social sector. Robert serves as a chief catalyst for community-driven change. Uh, his strategic leadership has been essential in shaping one Schenectady's vision and direction. And before joining the Schenectady Foundation, Robert also led the United Way of Schenectady County as CEO. And next, we're joined by Dr. David Chavez, a senior fellow with Community Science. David is internationally recognized for his experience in building community capacity, driving system change, and driving system change, I'm sorry. His work focuses on designing and evaluating strategies that build community power and tackle structural inequities. Uh, David's experience across national and local initiatives, including One Schenectady, um, will add incredible depth to this conversation. So these are your panelists, and we're happy to be with you all today. So a little bit about uh, our time today. So first, we'll start off uh, with discussing exactly what community-driven system change is and what it looks like in practice. And next, we'll dive into the Schenectady experience itself, how one Schenectady emerged to address systemic challenges and what impacts it had on the community. Then we'll explore the strategy, the ecosystem approach that we took inside of this work, focusing on how building, um, how building a power, a power building ecosystem can sustain long-term change and help scale community efforts. We'll also take a look at the 90 day uh, quick win strategy that we use to get buy in, a focused short term action uh, created rapid and tangible results in Schenectady and demonstrated what's possible when community power takes center stage. Uh, next, but most important, also we'll discuss the role of the funders. What does it mean for funders that want to be engaged in this type of work? Specifically, how can they align their resources, encourage collaboration, and provide critical infrastructure needed to support resident-driven change? And then finally, we'll wrap up with some key lessons we've learned on this journey so far, 
again, we are in the thick of it. We are this, all of this is still in process, right? So you're basically getting a presentation of where we are now and also where we're headed uh, uh, when we are in our quest to um, in community driven, supporting community driven system change work. So on the screen, you see a definition uh, of community driven system change. And ultimately it occurs when members of a historically disadvantaged community uh, leads and take collective action to achieve equitable system change. And what sets this approach apart from other uh, system change appro approaches is that it's truly driven by the community, especially by those who felt impacted by the inequities the most, right? So those that are most impacted. So rather than a top down, um, very prescriptive one size fit all solution. This approach uh, empowers residents to take lead in shaping the changes based off their lived experiences and needs. And when communities are at the center of the work, the solutions not only feel, uh, fit better, but they last because they were built from the inside out. I like to say, I wanna do things with you, not to you. And that is the essence of this, this strategy, right? So as we go and we uh, visit the ones, ones Connected East journey, keep in mind that this isn't just about hitting targets, right? It's, it's about creating the ecosystem that again, uh, empowers residents to keep driving the change they wanna see for the long haul. So why do we want to do uh, why would we embark on such an effort? Well, ultimately, when communities lead the way, we start to see some really powerful shifts, right? So first, the system begins to respond more quickly, you know, more quickly than normal, because we know that we can only move at the pace, right? And appropriately uh, to the needs of the community in which it's, it's serving. So it's no longer a top-down approach to change. And you actually see some change happening in real time, which we, we will discuss later to, today. Um, we also will see a boost in civic engagement. People get more involved, whether it's voting, whether it's volunteering, or just engaging in day-to-day -day community life. When, vote, when folks feel their voices are making a difference, they're more likely to show up and engage, continue to engage. It also brings together people working side by side, builds understanding and trust between the different groups, strengthening the social fabric of the community. Um, and by centering the voices of residents in general at any time, respecting their, their lived experience, hearing them and actually taking action, we're creating the conditions for meaningful, lasting impact that truly reflects what the needs, uh, the community needs and wants um, in, those, in those spaces. However, I know that sounds great. And of course, an effort such as this, while rewarding, it is not without its challenges, right? And we're not here to tell you that it is without challenges. So resident driven system change is extremely powerful, but whether, um, but there are some real obstacles um, in doing the work effectively. So I wanna walk through a couple of them uh, with you all. First, there are capacity gaps. So often residents don't necessarily start off with the same skills or experience, uh, experiences they need to drive long scale change, right? Um, many need support to, build or unlock their capacity in areas like advocacy or navigating complex systems or managing initiatives. And so this requires a real investment in training and development so resident leaders not only feel but are equipped to lead this work. Uh, the next is alignment and collaboration that also uh, uh, couples pretty well with the history and power differences sometimes. So bringing together diverse voices and interests are essential, right? When we wanna talk about, you know, taking collective action, but it's not always easy. It's not always easy. So facilitation is really important inside of this process and um, ensuring that folks are leaning into the we space instead of the me space, right? So in communities where there's a history of division, mistrust and aligning everyone under a shared vision can be a real challenge. Um, but building trust and collaboration across different groups um, takes time and careful effort. Next, we have history and the power differences. So existing power structures 
don't always welcome resident-led change, especially when it shifts in the decision-making authority. So those in power feel threatened, um, leading to resistance or even efforts to undermine the work. And navigating these power dynamics are delicate, right? People look at power like they look at a slice of pie. There are only so many slices, right? So though this is a very uh, delicate process, it is necessary inside of this work. Um, next huge thing is sustaining engagement, keeping residents engaged over a long haul is it simple, right? People's time, their energy is stretched thin. Um, and if progress feels slow for folks, there's a risk of disillusionment, right? And you wanna keep momentum going. You have to give folks something to continue to move forward, right? And giving them hope and saying that, hey, we can make this happen. And uh, that's one thing that the short win, that 90 day process really did teach us um, in maintaining that momentum and, um, keeping that buy-in from our resident leaders. Now, one of the biggest hurdles is resources. Resident-driven efforts um, often have limited resources to funding, technical expertise, and people power needed to sustain the, the initiative long-term, the effort long-term. And while you have resident leaders involved, you also want to be able to compensate them for their expertise, meaning their lived experiences when they're leaning into that. So what does that look like? Uh, so finding ways to secure resources for the long haul is also critical to ensure that these types of initi initiatives not only um, survive that, that period of time, but thrive and is sustainable moving forward. And then lastly, we have the institutional resistance or backlash. So let's be honest, y'all. I'm from the South. You'll hear a lot of y'alls. So <laughs> we're at the kitchen table right now. So let's be honest, y'all. Um, established institutions push back against resident-led initiatives often, right? So especially mm -hmm. if the change that you're proposing does um, challenge the status quo. Uh, this can make it really hard, right, and difficult to push through certain things, like push things forward, even if the community, the residents, those that are most impacted are behind them. That is a challenge that is going to be there regardless. And again, I want to I want to pause there um, and say that resistance is a natural response to change. It doesn't make folks a bad person. You just have to bring them along for the journey with you. Right. And so it's not that it's bad. It's actually understanding how to navigate um, that resistance that comes to be. Yeah. 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 Hi. Yeah. I just wanted as your question, I just want to fill in one point, emphasize one thing that you said is that um, that Schenectady and Schenectady and other places where we've worked, it's not just communities of color um, involved that um, that that history piece. Um, it's because it's issue focus. It brings together a, a wider net. And with that comes a lot of issues of how to work together and establishing that positive history together is one of the key components of dealing with, uh, with, with those historical divisions that have happened. So while the focus is on those who are historically, historically disadvantaged, um, a lot of people at different times of all backgrounds feel um, uh, disenfranchised by the larger system. And this has provided opportunity to work across race and across uh, economic class. And gender, right? And gender. Because we do know there's intersectionality in all of these things. Thank right. you so much. Thank you. All right. So um, let's talk about it a little bit. You're you're sitting like, hey, I'm hearing what David's saying. I'm hearing what Jasmine's saying. What's the it? What's the ecosystem? What is this all? What is the foundation that all these things are built on? And so our strategy, this this ecosystem um, we applied has four pillars, right? And the four pillars are media support. So strengthening the culture of transformative en engagement and action by changing the narrative in the public and in social media, right? So we're calling that our media support pillar. Like how is community engagement viewed in the media? Like, is it encouraged? What does that look like, right? And how does media support um, those things? The next is building community capacity. You heard, a, heard me earlier saying, hey, one of the challenges of this work is capacity. Um, not that you don't necessarily have the capacity, we just want to unlock that capacity, right? So building capacity, um, 
leans into building a coordinated system, right, in the ecosystem to build capacity for uh, capacity for transformative community engagement, power building. So we, in this case, we're calling it our capacity building hub. The third pillar is the funding collaboration. So fostering collaboration among funders to support community-driven system change work. Uh, how can funders come together and support other resident-led initiatives, you know, from things that are coming up from the community to say, hey, we're going to put some uh, funding around behind this because you know what your community needs best, right? And then lastly, the collective power building pillar, um, bringing together grassroots um, leaders and other or leaders of community led organizations to develop and take action on a common agenda um, through a neighborhood assembly model, which we will unpack um, in, the, in the next slide. Okay, so now we know the, the pillars. There are five entities, um, you can call it, or components that support uh, the, pil uh, the pillars uh, that I just shared. And they are the strategy and the oversight council um, illustrated here as the community change council. Um, you have the funders table, uh, you have the power building hub or the capacity building hub, you have the neighborhood assembly, and then you have the community driven initiative. Each one of these components uh, or entity have a very specific role inside of the ecosystem, right? And inside of this, the, the, the environment you're building for this thing, for this work to be successful. So the Community Change Council, right? The strategy and oversight component here um, in your top left corner is its function is to provide a supervision and oversight to the neighborhood assembly, the power building hub and the, the funders table to ensure that things are equitable, that we're leaning into the vision as established, right? That this is a resident led effort, a community driven effort, right? Um, the next one is the funders table. The funders table acts as a dedicated space uh, for funders to work with their peers um, to monitor resource needs based off what they're hearing from the council, from the neighborhood assembly, what's swelling up from the ground, right? And expanding the pool of available and existing new resources, aggregate, aggregating those resources and channeling those resources um, back to the community, to the community to actually drive those efforts. Um, the next is the power building hub. So the Power Building Hub supports strengthening the capacity and uh, collaboration across neighborhoods, across community groups, um, issue groups, grassroots groups, all the groups necessary that are all working in their own spaces doing the work um, as stakeholders. So this Power Building Hub will also facilitate some peer learning among these groups to enhance their capacity and, and build their skills in order to drive these community-driven efforts. And then next, uh, toward the center of your screen, you have the Neighborhood Assembly. Um, and this is a space where you would, there is a platform for community-led groups, resident leaders to set their common agenda. Now, I know you may be asking, hey, is there only one common agenda at a time? Absolutely not. In the perfect world of Jasmine, there'll be many things going <laughs> at one time. There could be multiple collective agendas because what we know is, again, a part of keeping, you know, keeping buy-in from community leaders is that if um, the, the neighborhood assembly identifies housing as an issue area and we are going to, um, combine and take collective action about around that, there may be another group that says, hey, we really wanna work on this issue of education. That, that can definitely happen. So assembly members are resident leaders, right? And representatives of these community-led groups, right? And depending on those collective actions, that collective agenda, um, the neighborhood assembly will birth what is illustrated at toward the bottom of the screen as your community-driven initiatives. So what is the system that, what is that collective agenda? What is What system is it addressing? Um, you'll hear later today more about housing as the system 
or and is it there? So is that the community uh, that could be that would be the community driven initiative there is around housing. There could also be multiple around safety, around uh, health, all those different things. So that's a little bit uh, about what you will hear about now. I'm sure you're wondering, again, I've said this multiple times, wait a minute, Jasmine, David, Robert, are all these components in place? No, they're not, no, no, they're not. And that's what we're here to talk to you about today because if we waited until we could put everything together, we would never take that first step. That first step would never happen. You have to take the first step, right? So in the first implementation of this phase, we bit off a piece of the overall strategy to take that first step. So we started with the Community Change Council is why it has a checkbox um, next to it. The Neighborhood Assembly also has a checkbox and the Community Driven Initiative um, has a, a checkbox. Um, and so we wanted to one, say, hey, this, is, this can work. We wanted proof of concept. We want to say, hey, people will come together. They have no problem coming together. If, if under the a set of circumstances in the proper environment with the proper supports that they could come together and drive a, a take collective action under a common agenda. But I want to pause for a minute here uh, because we haven't heard from Robert yet. And I'm pretty sure uh, in full disclosure, we see everyone who's registered. So I'm pretty sure you're wondering, hey, how did how did the Schenectady Foundation even get to this point? And I want to offer Robert, if you want to share a little bit about how you all got here. Uh, yes, thanks so much, Jasmine. <clears throat> so uh, I'm going to first set the scene a little bit uh, so you know uh, what Schenectady is like and um, uh, what our foundation uh, is, and then uh, go into how did we get here. And so I'll give you a little backdrop on, on the journey to getting into a formal um, systems change model. So uh, Schenectady, New York is, uh, is a, um, a city of 65,000 people. Um, roughly 50% of the population are uh, people of color. Uh, the city versus the county, which is a bit larger, is where you, know, um, you see most of the uh, difficult issues. Uh, coming up in terms of education, poverty, uh, the need for affordable and better housing, you know, all those things that are often typical of, of inner cities. Um, and so the city is where we focus first. Um, the Schenectady Foundation, we are a, uh, I'd say modest sized community foundation. Uh, and uh, we are specifically focused on uh, bettering the welfare of people in Schenectady County, New York. And so we can really focus on this population, uh, you know, very strongly. Um, so, um, how did we get here? So, um, I realized looking back uh, that we were actually doing uh, systems change work. We just didn't know that it was called systems change. So, we about I'd say at least ten years before we got here, we were doing things to raise the voice of people. Uh, and their energy or in the community who wanted to get things done. Um, and uh, you know, one, uh, we, there were several uh, programs, projects we did, but I'll just pick one, which I think is, uh, it's uh, really stands out uh, as similar to this. So back in 2017, we launched, launched what we call the Thriving Neighborhoods Challenge. And basically we said to the residents of the community, not to the nonprofits, but to the residents, what's your idea, right? What's your idea for making your neighborhood, your street, parts of your community a better place for you to live, right? And we had about uh, 40 responses. Uh, some of them were handwritten on a piece of paper. We, it was not a formal grant application. They could be handwritten. So it was completely accessible to anybody who wanted to submit their idea. Um, since that, uh, that first round, uh, we have, uh, to date, uh, supported 25 uh, resident-driven uh, projects and invested about $750,000 into what residents wanted to see. 
And we got a lot of support actually from the city of Schenectady uh, who became a, a funding partner with us on a number of these projects. Um, so then each of those resident groups, well, how do they build capacity? We uh, established um, or we paired them up with established nonprofit organizations who became their fiscal sponsor. And so the job of the fiscal sponsor was to assist them in planning, uh, to do the purchasing and help them to kind of navigate through implementing their project. Uh, and, and this was a huge hit um, in the city. Um, and then uh, 2020 happened. I think maybe some of us remember 2020 a little bit. Um, but you know, we had an extraordinary community response uh, and, and recovery through that first uh, year, 2020. But coming through it, as we headed into 2021, many people, colleagues, residents who we met with uh, saw this as an opportunity that we don't have to go back to what we were doing pre-COVID because regulations had been relaxed, although now they're, they put, put them back on, uh, which I like to change. But um, uh, there was a sense, this was urgency of how do we continue working together collaboratively and how do we start affecting the systems that residents uh, have to work with, have to deal with uh, every day. And that eventually led us to um, a relationship with community science. Uh, and uh, we started, I think the first engagement was about 20 months. Uh, we involved about, I don't know, 25 uh, folks in kind of a work group. There was a, a community survey that was done. There was a lot of data collected to inform us, you know, what what was the community looking at like, and was it ready to do this kind of work? And out of that came the pillars that Jasmine just, um, just uh, uh, demonstrated to you. So the strategy of pushing out a quick win program was started in early March of this year uh, with a challenge of having the council, the Community Change Council, identify an issue and then work to affect change on that issue during 90 days of action and an additional roughly 30 days of engagement to understand the process they've been through and provide feedback to us. So uh, at this point, I'll ask Jasmine, would you take us through the what that 90 day process looked like? Yeah. Thanks Robert for sharing how we got here. There was a lot of pre-work uh, to get here. So thank you for that. So. Over the 90 days, there was a kickoff meeting with that inaugural uh, Community Change Council, right? Um, to orient them to the process and what we wanted to do, right? Like this, hey, we're, how, what does engagement look like? You know, what do we need from you? And also getting their buy-in and agreement to say, okay, I'm with you. Um, also in that kickoff, the, a very important thing was for people to get to know each other. So a lot of these folks that came together, they knew of each other, right? They're all working. They're working on different things. They are resident leaders, organizational leaders. Um, and I mean, from the neighborhood association leader to leaders of well-known grassroots nonprofits um, in, inside of Schenectady. We, it ran the gamut, right? Even including like everyday residents. Um, that had a leadership experience and wanted to join the, um, the process. And, and so we did have a three-day kickoff meeting. Um, we did have norms. We had ways of uh, different ways of engagement or what I like to call rules of engagement. And then uh, previously uh, in Robert's timeline, he talked about, hey, getting an idea of what types of things do we want to see, right? What change can happen? A part of our role at Community Science, and you know, David is a, a community has experience in community organizing, and so do I. It was about like, hey, what's realistic to get done in 90 days? What can we really truly do in 90 days? So reviewing the desires of the community and then presenting it back to them and saying, hey, this is what could be possible in 90 days how does this look, right? Based off what you share, based off what you said, these are the things we think we could get done um, in a 90 day process. And so inside that three days, there was an issue identified, right? There was an action taken 
there in uh, initially it was around policy change, folks want policy change, right? But you know, you can only do things at the speed of the system, how fast the system can go. And so if meetings aren't happening to ensure that can happen, then maybe that's not the best thing to go with. So um, the body, the Community Change Council said, hey, actually, we would like to make data, get data publicly available that the city has to residents so that they can make their housing decision, right? So that was the thing that this body and this, uh, the Community Change Council during this short, this short 90 days of action was working toward was to say, hey, we need to make the data publicly available. And that was the systemic, um, that was the systemic outcome we were looking for. Um, in that there are other things that came to be where, hey, we not only want to do that, but we want to make sure that it's digestible. So we want a website. We want all these different these different things to make sure that is we don't all only have the data publicly available, that's the system's win, but making it accessible for Schenectady residents. And so that is what you see across the timeline, that shift in action, that the establishment of that community-driven initiative, which for Schenectady in this 90 days was the establishment, the establishment of host, um, Host, which is housing one Schenectady. That is the community driven initiative that covers anything to do with uh, the system around housing, the housing system, right? And so inside of that process, there were a lot of things that the council members did from, you know, doing outreach, meeting with people they would not normally meet with, um, the, the desire to make data publicly available was to say, hey, how can not only homeowners have information, but, but renters, like how can they get information around landlords? And so again, wanting to walk with people and do things with folks, the council engaged with the United Tenant Association. They also engaged with Schenectady landlords for um, influencing change to say, hey, we're not here to be antagonistic or we're not trying to be, we're not trying to shake the table, but we are trying to shake the table, but we also want to work with you. Like, how can we do this together? Can you support us in making this data publicly available from the city? And so ultimately, before the end of the 90 days, um, the Community Change Council was able to get the commitment from the mayor's office um, to make data uh, publicly available to residents. That was the system's win, y'all. That happened in 90 days. That happened in 90 days. I just want to say that again. That happened in 90 days, right? In addition to that, not only did we get that data, make that data publicly available for um, Schenectady residents, but also the Community Change Council Neighborhood Assembly hosts, like these, these folks, <laughs> They went back to the community and say, hey, do we have all the correct data, right? Do we get the right data, right? And Or should we ask for additional data? So there was a resident survey. There was a community survey that went out and said, how would you use this information? What are the things that you take into consideration when making housing, um, housing uh, decisions? Right. And so from that, not only were we able to identify the appropriate data that Schenectady residents said, hey, actually, this is this is the information I need to be able to make a decision around housing. Um, we also were able to gauge um, interest of residents, resident leaders in engaging in another uh, another resident driven effort. So now we're continuing to build momentum as we go, right? And the folks that were engaged through the community um, survey were people that were in the, the stakeholder groups of the resident, the community leaders uh, in their organizations, but also uh, previously, from when we, Robert shared earlier, we talked to, we had a lot of town halls, we had a lot of uh, uh, focus groups with different groups when uh, developing this strategy, we went back to them. And asked. So it was also like a, hey, we are really doing something, right? Like how often are we creating strategies that sit on this, the shelf? We wanted to also provide an update to, hey, remember us, this is where we've been and this is where we've been able to go. Uh, right. And then from that resident engagement survey, we identified the appropriate data uh, that was needed by residents to make housing related decisions. But something that took 
place outside and beyond the 90 days was that the Community Change Council were, they were invited by the city council um, to present at a meeting. Like they didn't have to call them, you know, the council didn't have to call the city council, the council didn't have to call, right? But the city council actually said, hey, we would like you all to come in and share with us what you're doing because we want. And obviously it was clear to them that uh, this group, this body was doing something um, important in the community. Um, but ultimately they were able to present to city council, not only to share where they, what they've been up to, but also the desires of where they would like to go and also get their support and buy-in. David. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to um, pull out some points that I think are really important. First of all, just to take a step back is that basically community sciences role primarily uh, Jasmine and Noah, um, you know, we're providing that uh, uh, an early version of that power building hub through capacity building, through facilitation, and by creating connections. It's an inter the idea of an intermediary that did that. So this was an initial step to get that going. So while this wasn't all there in its full glory, it, it was happening. That component was there. I think the second part is that in that role, I think one of the things that came up a lot was keep on asking that question that Jasmine and such had, which was, how is the systems change? Um, you know, because people have this, such a tendency to go to a program. And so I think that played a very um, uh, critical role in, in this, is that repeated question helping folks understand. We all talk about it, but what it is concretely. And the system change was that the city wasn't uh, releasing that information. It was not acceptable that individual efforts by these groups to get something like that never got off the ground. Um, and so this, with using the connections, using the group, and using how they organize, they were able to make the small um, change. No different than small wins typically in community organizing, but the beauty was the time frame made it happen quickly. And it's taking something other than a street sign and cleaning their streets, streets that this is a small win that could win and yet develops that they could win by developing a short-term strategy with that time frame on it. So I just wanted to emphasize those points there. Thanks, David. So now that we we have the system win and it's a very clear systems win, um, but you know, there's still a need for funding, right? So we are in the process, uh, we're still in this work. Um, I want to invite Robert and David, I want you to invite you all to speak more to the funder's role inside of this. Okay, so um, one of our next steps, and this is in uh, progress, um, it, well, there's two. One is uh, further developing the capacity building aspect of this and uh, we're actually doing some of that. Uh, we, we've we supported uh, as, a, as a first uh, kind of a pilot, was very successful, a community advocates group um, who went through training, who formed relationships, and they're attached to another uh, thing we launched, which is a, a food council. And so these people came from the community. Um, uh, they stepped forward. They they loved this program. They made uh, you know great personal relationships, and what they've done to date is they are doing what we call um, poverty and food speakouts, where it will will go to an elected official or will go have a community meeting where they will tell their stories, and people will get a different sense of of what that looks like, what food insecurity looks like from a very personal view. So we're, we're doing some of that. It needs further development. The other thing that's important is creating uh, this funders table. Um, we're, we've had a, a, a Zoom call with many funders from this region. Uh, a number are interested and we're starting, we're taking some steps to get that uh, formed. And um, I think it's, it's important, like it says, no single organization can tr achieve transformative change alone. Of course, that's true. Um, and also, I, you know, this is, as you can imagine, doing this kind of work, uh, it's not without its risks. Um, you know, there's a potential for blowback. 
uh, whether it might come from a donor or donor groups, it might come from uh, some institutions. And to the extent that uh, funders are united in putting forth um, and really leaning into uh, equity as, as a core value, this is one way we can express it. It's tangible and uh, residents can actually see that this can work. And for us funders, we just have to let them lead and support support them to do that work. So uh, I'd say, you know, we're, we're kind of giving up control, if you would. Um, and but by giving up control, we're giving we're building power in the community. So I think all funders just have to be there first in understanding that and getting that straight. Uh, what is this about? Who are we giving power to? Does that feel threatening? Well, it might to some funders. Uh, so that's really why you, you have to really lean into this, take a back seat as a funder and let the residents lead. Uh, and what our role is, is not just financially supporting them, but we can provide information. We can provide guidance uh, to resident groups on their process and uh, really just help support the organization to happen. Uh, so um, I think it's, it's, it's going to be, uh, this will, be much stronger when we have the funders table in place uh, and we have shared, we, uh, the idea is eventually we'll, we, uh, some of us will co-fund uh, some of this work together. So it's not just on any one of us, uh, but we can pool resources from a variety of funders, uh, hopefully both private and public. David, did you have something to add on that? I, I would I would just add that um, what's really what was really critical and where we've been so far is that um, there was there is an interest in in this and that um, it's you know and and that while there's a lot of air discussion about it this is one of the few opportunities there's the only opportunity that the fund, funders table mentioned that where funders could come together and talk about the subject um, so I think that's just important when we think about the role and purpose coming up next. I think that the covers. Great, thanks, David. Okay, um, so why support community-driven action? Um, you know, this can be looked at both through a, a business uh, lens, like how is this good business for us to be doing? Um, and it, it can also be viewed just through a values lens. And I think uh, for us, it's been a combination of the two, right? So uh, one is, you know, we if we have adopted equity as a core value of our foundation, uh, but it's one thing to put it up on a list of values. It's another thing to actually express it. It's another thing to actually move in that direction. So when I say lean into your values, uh, that's what we're doing. Um, we're not just putting nice, uh, you know, kind of words up there or, talking about our values. No, we're living them. Uh, and in terms of a business, like don't all of us as funders, those of you who are on the call as funders, we really want to get to the root of the problem, right? Uh, it's one thing to sort of do patchwork grant making that uh, you know may give some temporary fixes or some incremental improvements. But if you really want to get to the root of an issue, you have to go to the community level. You need to hear what people are experiencing, how they experience those systems. And it's really only through that mechanism that you'll truly understand what's going on. And you get an entirely different picture than uh, if you just went to uh, some institutions and asked them what was going on, you'd get a slightly different viewpoint. So if we're truly gonna get at the kind of outcomes we, I think we all wanna have, uh, and we really want to understand what the issue is, this piece of, of, of building power in the community is essential. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and just to um, add to that, especially around the systemic transformation point, I think that one of the things uh, we can't emphasize enough is that building power is a matter of people getting what they want, um, collectively what they want, building community power. And by having that power, you then have 
the force to make larger scale changes. And we have this throughout our history. You look at big movements, okay, where the really the needle moved, where there was systemic change. It took power from the grassroots, from the people most effective, as well as allies and champions to support that. Um, and so that's the importance while funders tend to walk, work on systemic change. And that's been a big part of the language for years. It's never had the force, never brought the force. And it's also been single issue. OK, working on a project so that organizing and power building has been around a single advocacy agenda or a smaller advocacy agenda and never was able to maintain a small force, a significant power and force to make those changes. We're talking about here as we move on to the role of the um, the funders table, we're realizing that this is remember, this is an we're having this as an ecosystem. This is the big picture. This is not about getting a single initiative going, but this is getting hundreds of initiatives going and multiple levels throughout Schenectady and other communities to be able to make substantial changes. And so how do you get those thousand flowers blooming? How do you get those moving and provide a support system for them so that it's not just one issue at a time, but there's a whole bunch of changes and very powerful changes because you now have a highly engaged and active and powerful citizenry. Um, so I just want to emphasize that piece as to why this is. This is not a project. This is not a single issue. This is make this is the start of making a lot of things happen in all directions. Um, the I'm going to talk now about the purpose and the role of the funders table. Um, and it's to be a place for, for, for funders to come together. And, and if funder affinity groups are not a new idea, um, what is, uh, I think, unique to this particular um, uh, type of, 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 of funding uh, affinity and coming together is that um, it's, as we found with others, uh, around the country. I mean, there's several from Connecticut to California, Virginia, uh, local cities have funders table focus on power building, community organizing, and various forms of that. Um, what we're finding is some additional support. Not only is it a way to combine support, but it's a long-term ability to survive, provide support, that you're providing a sustainable uh, infrastructure, funding structure, because this stuff is not going to be solved in two, three, four, five years, okay? Um, the second part of it is that, um, in all frankness, is that we've seen with many individual funders taking this on, is that they become then the single target. It's, you know, of the, uh, when there's backlash, then an individual funder gets singled out. And especially for community foundations that are really dependent on their donor base, um, this can create a problem. So it's really not only sharing the responsibility um, and sharing the, uh, the, the the funding support, but it's also, and, sh and learning together, um, but it's also a matter of being able to say, this is really a community and bunch of funders coming together and you can't, it's the same idea we do in the community, working in a community, you can't separate us, we're together on this and you can't single out one foundation for backlash um, because um, of the broader appeal. So that um, the purposes as it mentions there, is not only to become a learning function by having presentation, helping to problem solve, to really discuss on how priorities to support each other, um, but also to be able to um, launch collective initiatives and to provide support, as Robert mentioned earlier, for that capacity building infrastructure that needs to be in place to keep that level of effort going. I don't know if you have more, Robert, you have more to, to, to reflect on in terms of where, where it is now. And I think a big part of this, and we can talk about discussion, is you know the, how the small win was a key piece um, to being able to go out and prove to other funders right, that this is possible. Uh, I think Jasmine called it a proof of concept. It was really the first thing to be able to open not only internally the foundation, but to other funders to say, OK, everybody likes success. And they're now willing to join in and learn more. So I don't care more to add, Robert. Well, just that um, because this was a, a tangible, right? We we were going to commit ourselves for ninety days uh, and support that work and actually get something done. Versus it being more philosophical. You know, I'm aware that there have been other things happening within our region uh, to kind of um, do some um, systems change work. But the feedback I've gotten from some of the participants is it, 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 it 
seemed more uh, about the concept, about the theory. Um, it was less about actually doing something. And uh, I think this is important to bring to other funders. So it's not just an idea. You know, we have some proof that this can work. Thank you, David and Robert. And I'm just being transparent. I'm, I'm looking at time. We have about seven minutes. I know that one of the the questions was around lessons learned. So I wanna make sure we can uh, share just a few things that we learned um, inside of this process. And then uh, we have another uh, question around um, board buy-in and the 90 day approach. So uh, just a little bit around lessons learned. Uh, one, this thing takes time. You all don't think that it's gonna happen overnight, the prep that, you know, got us to this short term action and being able to uh, get the short win. There was time, We there was engagement, there was uh, opportunity for relationship building and, um, and trust um, building. So one thing is that it takes time and you cannot um, rush the process. Um, the other thing I would like to share or highlight from our list here, um, and then I'll invite Robert or David to, um, bring one of their favorites here around lessons learned is this concept around giving up control and power, right? Um, and trying to con uh, control the process. It is sharing power, right? Like you're sharing power with community to say, hey, I want to support you in the things that you need. And what does that look like? Ultimately, what do you get out of that as a funder? What do you get out of that as a community? And that's the, the thing is the bang for buck. At least you know you're doing something, right? That one community wants to happen is likely to be sustained because it is moved by um, community. And like, hey, this is something that we invested in that community wanted to see and that we did it with them and not to them. Again, to Robert's point, leaning into those um, values. Um, and I think uh, one more thing is, having a communications plan was huge because it's not if, but when you get backlash, it's not if, but when, it's not if, but when, anytime power is challenged, there is a, there is resistance. Again, doesn't make the folks inside of these systems bad people. It is just a natural human response to change when you're challenging the status quo. Um, is there other, um, any other lessons learned that either one of you want to highlight before we I have. Yes. Okay, Robert, please. Oh, yeah. I, I know we got to move along, but uh, you know, this may seem obvious, but it's it takes a while to do this. A pre work a prerequisite to do this work is you have to build trust and relationships. Uh, and you have to be consistent over time. And so I'd say one of the things that we were doing right, I'd mentioned kind of going back 10 years, is we were consistently engaging the community and listening to them. So when we started to recruit people to be involved, um, they were open to listening because they knew we weren't gonna back out. They knew that we were committed and what we say we do, we do. Uh, so if if you're not ready, if you don't have that developed, you know, you're gonna have to work on that before you get going. Great, thank you. And, and my quick, uh pieces are twofold. One is that knowing the difference, that's not on the list, but I want to emphasize it. Something that was a lot of talk is that knowing the, knowing what lead, community leaders are versus people who are outspoken versus just somebody you like that's in the neighborhood or looks the way that you hope somebody would look at the table. Um, so really looking at community leaders are people with a constituency. They have an organization behind them. They lead a group and they represent a Lisa group and, and often more than any of us do even if it's five people, 10 people, 20 people. That was a big idea of just picking out. That doesn't mean that they're an executive director of a nonprofit. That is a person who leads an organization. It's a person who has a resident uh, accountability to residents beyond themselves and their immediate family. That's a very important part to distinguish here. And that was a big thing versus the usual people who show up who are non pre profits who are grantees to learn that. And the last one I just can say very quickly. Do not underestimate the role, the points of capacity building and plan it out in advance. Everyone assumes the capacity to do something you've never done before is there. 
but it isn't. And I've seen this mistake in all sorts of initiatives throughout my career has been this one issue that underestimating capacity, realizing that that was what was missed and then having to try to recoup from that. That capacity building also has to do with facilitation, as I mentioned, no connections, as well as being able to conflict transformation and facilitate those discussions and those disagreements. That's my piece. Thanks, David. And um, Noah, if we can move on to the um, last slide, I just want to pose a question to Robert that um, we received. Um, how did the quick win approach aid in getting buy-in from the board? Your board. Well, as I, I think, as I said earlier, I mean, uh, uh, it was that um, this the work was tangible, right? Something came of it uh, versus... Uh, you know, they'd been hearing me talk about it for a while. Uh, the concept sounds beautiful, right? It sounds like something we ought to be doing, but is this actually going to work? And that was always the question. So uh, in bringing it back to them, because now we have more work to do going forward into 2025 and 26, uh, you know, uh, my hope is that they really will see that this works. And when I uh, present an outlandish plan and budget to them uh, next month, they'll be totally on board. Thank you, thank you. Um, out of respect for everyone's time, I just wanna let everyone know that yes, the resources will be available to you. There is a QR code on the screen that I'm also gonna invite Robert to share more about. And if you have not done so already, please hear from my wonderful colleagues in our upcoming webinars on November 4th and November 14th. Um, if you haven't registered, you don't wanna miss that. Um, Robert, do you wanna share in any information regarding the QR code folks are seeing on their screen? Yeah, just quickly, a couple of things. One is, I know there were a lot of questions uh, posed uh, that came through. Um, if you wanna track me down, it's easy to find me, the Schenectady Foundation. Um, send, me, send me an email. I'm happy to respond to any other questions you have following this. Uh, very happy to talk with you. The second is, uh, okay, how are we going to support grassroots efforts? And so one of the things we established alongside of this process was we created a fund, Grassroots Fund for Equity. Uh, that's going to be completely, it is completely um, uh, designed to support small grassroots organizations who are out there doing good work. They don't have resources. They need support. And so uh, we've raised in our first uh, year, we've raised uh, a little over $300,000 toward this, and we're going to continue to build it so it becomes a permanent fund. So that's our QR card. If, we, if we've touched your heart in any way, uh, you can use that QR code to make a contribution to the grassroots fund. Um, if you're so kind. But um, I, as I said, I'm happy to respond to any of the questions you have. Just e give me an email. Thank you for to every one of you who joined us today. Um, again, if you have any questions, feel free to follow up. Um, and I also want to thank, thank our esteemed panelists, David Chavez and Robert Carrera. Thank you so much for bringing all your gifts uh, to today's conversation. And to all of you, until next time, bye-bye. Yeah, thank you, Jasmine and Noah. And no one.